Um, welcome back for the afternoon session of this excellent conference. Um, my name is Moon Duchin. I'm a mathematician at Tufts up the road, and I work on redistricting. So um, ordinarily redistricting, one of the interests of the area is that it's so intensely interdisciplinary. So today we have an experiment, a monodisciplinary panel on redistricting. So we have four mathematicians um, telling you about different ways that math is hopefully illuminating the redistricting problem. So the, the format that we're going to use is 20-minute talks um, in turn from the three speakers, and then I will give a presentation that hopefully brings that together, and then we'll turn it over for questions. We're pretty serious about saving time for questions, so make sure you have some. Okay, and with that, it's a pleasure to introduce Dustin Mixon from The Ohio State University for the first talk. All right, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Very good. I'm Dustin. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, an interesting tension, a tension between uh, the, the slides and the computer. <laughs> uh, we're going to be OK. We tried this several times before, and we were fine. Yeah, yeah. The problem is I just have to, yeah, I have to see it first. OK. What I'll say as he's doing that is that this happens every time. And what's so great about it is that one of the things we're talking about is technological interventions <laughs> to like fix a pressing civic problem. Um, and right, yeah. and when you, when you uh, get right. into that business, you understand how unreliable your technology will always end up being. So uh, uh, there's other types of tension. Uh, the, the one that we're going to talk about in this talk is a tension between fairness and geometry. So uh, by now, I think you understand the story of redistricting. Uh, but just briefly, uh, there's so many uh, representatives in the House of Representatives. And uh, each one represents a district, uh, some districts make up an entire state. Uh, other states are broken up into a bunch of districts. And the way uh, the signal we use to, to break up states into districts is the census. So every 10 years, we know where everybody lives. And we, uh, we, we break states up into districts accordingly. So when we do this, uh, what you would like is for, in future elections, when you look at how many votes are cast that happen to be blue or red, that that somehow reflects the proportion of seats that end up being blue or red, OK? So I'm showing you a curve here. It's the dream. It's called partisan symmetry. So if 50% of the votes are red, then about 50% of the seats end up being red. And uh, furthermore, if you increase uh, or decrease, then the votes, uh, the, the number of seats that are given will increase and decrease accordingly. Uh, following some curve, you want to be symmetric so that uh, there's some sort of fairness across the parties. Okay? Uh, what happens in the real world is different. Um, there's, uh, there's this phenomenon called gerrymandering. So what, uh, what folks like to do uh, is they like to uh, draw boundaries of districts in a way that helps them, helps their party get, uh, get more seats. Uh, this is a font that's available online, uh, so you can text your friends uh, with, with fonts made purely of congressional districts. Okay. Great. Um, so we're interested in making gerrymandering an artifact of the history, like just keep it in history, move forward without gerrymandering. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to understand the problem better. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look at two facets of this problem. So my talk will be cut up into two parts. The first part is district shapes. So uh, ever since the word gerrymandering was coined, we would point out gerrymandering based on shape signal. So this is. 
uh, a district uh, for the Massachusetts State Assembly that has uh, a weird looking district. It, it's the profile of a salamander, according to the Boston Gazette. Um, the governor who approved this, his name was Gary, and so they made a portmanteau called Garymander, and then English happened, now we call it gerrymander. Um, a Washington Post recently uh, was making fun of various districts for their shape. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to make fun of district shape, but it's not necessarily productive. That's one of the themes of this talk. Um, before we can get there, uh, let's think about what does it mean for a shape to be funny looking? Okay, so this is a funny looking shape. This is a district in uh, one of North Carolina's maps from earlier in this decade. North Carolina's made a few rounds of this. Um, this, is, this is a funny shape because you, you walk along the perimeter and it jigs left and jags right and just to, just to capture a certain amount of area. It seems to be wasting a lot of perimeter to capture that area. Okay. So uh, there's, a, there's a way you can formalize that. Uh, just look at these two shapes, this circle and the square. They happen to capture uh, different amounts of area even though they have the same perimeter. You see the circle is capturing more area and the square is capturing less. This can be formalized uh, in a theorem. This is the isopyrometric inequality. So take, it, take any shape in the plane, like on this blackboard right here. Think of a shape, and I want you to think of what its area is. That's a number. I also want you to think of what the perimeter is. That's another number. Uh, you take the area and multiply it by four pi. You take the length and you multiply it by itself. Those are two numbers, and one's always less than or equal to the other. And they're gonna be equal precisely when the shape you're looking at is a circle. Okay, this is the isoparametric inequality. Um, so it took a while for mathematicians to actually get that right. Uh, we, we've known the answer for a long time. There's an interesting history of math lesson there, of mathematicians not knowing how to prove theorems. But uh, once we figured it out, there were some political scientists that got wise and realized that they could use these numbers to score different shapes based on how weird they look. So you take the the small number divided by the big number, this gives you a number between zero and one. One means it's a circle, zero means something terrible happened, okay? So uh, your favorite shapes have these scores, and if you look at uh, the shape of one of the congressional districts, you get something much worse, much closer to zero, okay? That's the story here. So uh, we have this Palsby Popper score, um, and we can use it to detect whether a shape is weird. Um, but that's, uh, that's not always a good signal for what we actually want to defeat. We want to defeat gerrymandering. There's some false positives you can get, and there's some false negatives you can get. Uh, one, of these false negative, one of these false positives is uh, the coastline paradox. So how, how long is the perimeter of Great Britain? Um, well, it depends on your units, right, Moon? It depends on the units. So the, uh, if, you, if you use a long ruler, then you can uh, move it along the, the shoreline of Great Britain, and you'll get a, a different number than if you use a really short ruler. You add up those little bits, end up with a big, big number, big, big coastline, okay? So there's some sort of fractal thing going on here. And this has repercussions whenever you have like a river, on the boundary of your favorite state, then you're gonna have a, a, a district sitting next to that boundary and it's gonna receive uh, a terrible Palsby Popper score. Um, here's, here's that shape we were making fun of in the previous slide, okay? Uh, this happens to not be an example of partisan gerrymandering. This is, this is an example of uh, people drawing a district to respect culture. So these two earlobes are, um, uh, they correspond to Hispanic populations and they wanted to link those populations so that they were uh, cultur culturally represented. Um, ev everyone around that area uh, is blue. This is not a partisan gerrymander and everyone's happy with this. So it's another false positive. False negatives. There's this thing called the ham sandwich theorem. Ask me about it. 
But, uh, but the upshot is whenever a state has the majority, you can cut up the state to make the majority get all the seats. It's always possible. And you can do it with straight lines. So straight lines are not going to be flagged as a weird shape. And uh, so Wisconsin won Trump just barely. Nope, Trump, that's, uh, Trump won Wisconsin just barely. And because of that, we are able to make uh, all eight districts in Wisconsin red. Um, that's, a result, that's, that's a consequence of the ham sandwich theorem. We're also to make seven out of eight districts go blue. And we don't have an explanation for that. Um, there's something weird about political geography that made that possible. It's, that one's not a consequence of the ham sandwich theorem. So it's scary. And this happens in the real world. So the current iteration of the North Carolina map looks like this. Uh, they pack Charlotte and uh, Raleigh and uh, Chapel Hill and some other things to make three blue districts and 10 red districts. Okay? They have 50% of the vote, but they have 10 out of 13 districts. Okay? And all these shapes don't look weird. So uh, we want to move beyond shape. What else can we do? Uh, that's the second part, votes versus seats. So this is the, is that 10 minutes remaining or 10 minutes complete? Oh, 10 plus 10 equals 20. Fantastic. <laughs> hey, uh, we're, we're halfway done, guys. OK. So, uh, so we have this uh, votes to seats curve. Uh, and this, this is what we'd love. Remember, we'd like. Uh, we like 50% of the vote to turn to 50% of the seats. Um, we'd like, uh, I mean, we'd really like something like 75% of the votes means 75% of the seats. But in the absence of that, we'd want it to be that if the other side gets 75%, then they get the same percent of seats. That's what the symmetry is giving us here. That's why if you were to rotate this curve 180 degrees, it looks the same. That's what we'd like. Um, that's a difficult thing to ask for. Um, Let's ask for something extremely weak, okay? This is extremely weak. First, let's satisfy the Constitution. So I want uh, the districts to have about the same number of people, okay? This is one person, one vote. Um, this, uh, I'm, I'm gonna relax that a little. You don't even need to be exactly the same number of people. Uh, I just want approximately the same number of people. Heck, I just want approximately the same number of voters in each district, okay. Uh, another thing I want is I want the uh, Paul's v. Popper score to not be too small. Um, here I'm saying 0 0.01. That's even smaller than what we had in that weird district, okay? So I'm, it doesn't seem like a big ask. And finally, instead of asking for this partisan symmetry curve, this S-curve looking thing, let's just ask that if you get 49% of the vote, then you'll definitely, I guarantee, you will get at least 1% of the seats, okay? That's a very weak ask. So I'm asking uh, to satisfy the Constitution uh, with one person, one vote. I'm asking for not extremely weird shapes, and I'm asking for 49% of the vote implies 1% of the seats, and that's already impossible, okay? It's impossible to ask for that in the worst case. And by that I mean it's possible for the voters to distribute themselves in a way that you cannot satisfy all three of those simultaneously. Okay? So uh, the proof is by picture here. Um, so uh, let's think of a, a, a state that's a square for the moment. And I'm going to break up that square into a bunch of little squares. In each of those little squares, I'm going to put uh, slightly more than half blue. Okay, so the blue has the majority, and the majority is peanut butter spread across the state. Um, what this means is that if you were to draw uh, nice looking districts, then you're not using a lot of perimeter, so you're going to be cutting through very few of those little squares. Okay, and what that means is that the interior, like most of the squares are unscathed, so the majority that blue has is going to persist. So when you have these really nice looking districts, blue is going to win all of them, even though uh, red has 49% of the vote. Um, 
So for the third panel, this is one that I drew by hand. Uh, I wanted to make it so that red gets two out of five districts. And uh, you can see that they look weird, and I felt bad drawing these. <laughs> like, these are not people, this is an abstraction, and yet I felt bad because uh, I was trying real hard to make something that I thought was fair or something, okay? So that was an interesting personal exercise. Um, this is uh, more than just an abstraction. So uh, in this state, 30% of the vote is Republican. And if you look at the congressional districts, they're all uh, taken by Democrats, okay? So I'm not claiming that Massachusetts is gerrymandered. Um, I, I'm claiming that there's more to the story. There's some uh, political geography that you have to look at to understand what's going on here, okay? So it's, it's subtle. Um, let's, let's kick the subtlety up a notch. Um, sometimes the set of maps that comply with the law is complicated, okay? So uh, these are just, uh, these, these are the specifications that are required when you do redistricting for the Wisconsin State Assembly. And there's, there's a lot of things you have to satisfy simultaneously. Um, the, uh, I wanted to think about the space of, so I have this weird set and I'm trying to find a member of that set that happens to be fair, okay? So how hard could it be to find a fair map amongst the set of compliant maps? That's the question. Uh, the answer is it's hard. Um, so in order to formalize that, I have this model for what a compliant map is. Uh, you need to satisfy the Constitution, and I want the shapes to not look weird uh, under some notion of geographic compactness. And then fairness, again, means that if you have 49% of the vote, then you get at least 1% of the seats. Okay? It's a weak ask, and it's hard. Um, it happens to be this thing called NP-hard, um, and if, if you're not familiar with that terminology, all you need to know is that if you have an algorithm that quickly finds a fair map amongst compliant maps, then you can use your algorithm as a subroutine to break any cryptographic cipher. <laughs> okay? So, uh, online banking is at your disposal all of a sudden. So now, uh, the thinking is like cryptographic assumptions are such that that is hard, that's not going to happen, um, and we should transfer that feeling over to gerrymandering to say that uh, finding a fair map amongst compliant maps is hard, okay? So I've talked about a few things and they all follow a common theme. There's a tension between shape and fairness. Uh, sometimes it's possible to gerrymander with nice shapes. Remember, I cut up Wisconsin using straight lines, and North Carolina does, uh, does its own thing uh, currently. Um, sometimes you're going to need to use strange shapes in order to uh, get a fair map, even, though, even if it makes you feel weird when you're drawing it, uh, like it did for me in the example of the square. And then uh, uh, sometimes it's hard to find a fair map amongst compliant maps. So um, if, if that makes you sad, um, don't worry. Uh, these, are, these are just worst case scenarios, okay? We were talking about worst case scenarios uh, in the morning. And um, what worst case scenarios do is they don't necessarily uh, correspond to uh, most of the instances you encounter in real life, okay? So I tell you it's impossible to get a redistricting protocol that does a thing in the worst case. Well, it might do that thing in the cases you care about. Okay. Um, what this does tell us is it gives us some understanding of what we could possibly ask for in a redistricting protocol. Okay. All right, that's my talk, thank you. Okay, so actually while we're changing over, um, to Wes, who's our next speaker. Um, it's a good time to ask if anyone has a clarifying question. We'll have time for sort of deeper questions later, but I was <coughs> noticing in the morning that it might have been nice to ask clarifying questions here and there. Shelley? I do have a clarifying question. I was kind of confused. Why 
why the fair one is not just a straight 45 degree one? Right. So uh, for reasons like uh, Massachusetts, where uh, you get, so blue has 70% of the vote and somehow they have 100% of the seats. If you do, uh, if you collect statistics like this, you'll notice that there's this tendency amongst maps that are considered not, to not be gerrymandered, that they follow an S-shaped curve. I dispute that, but we'll discuss. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, our next speaker is Wes Pegden from Carnegie Mellon, whose talk is called Using Math to Detect Gerrymandering. OK, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to start by uh, you know, giving an introduction again for, for some of what we heard, but uh, I'll try to be pretty quick. Uh, yeah, closer to the mic, yes. Uh, or can I just detach this? OK, is that working? OK, great. OK, sorry, I just want to make sure I can see the screen. OK, so, um, so uh, again, let's talk about the House of Representatives just one more time. So it has uh, these individual members in the House of Representatives, and un unlike some sort of uh, parliamentary system, these are elected in single member districts, right? And uh, these districts are redrawn every, uh, every 10 years in response to the census. And uh, there's no mathematical guarantee of proportionality in the system, right? There's nothing that says that if roughly 60% of the votes go to one party, they have to get roughly 60% of the seats. Um, and so there are a lot of examples where this fails to happen. Uh, so one example in my home state of Pennsylvania in 2012, Democrats got you know, a bare majority. Uh, uh, this isn't even really a bare majority, right? The other side in this election doesn't get 100% minus this. They get uh, significantly less than that. So Democrats got a majority, but only five out of 18 of the congressional seats in Pennsylvania in 2012. In North Carolina, the same thing happened. Democrats got more than 50% of the vote, only four out of 13 seats. In Wisconsin, if you looked at the statewide assembly race, so this is, not, this is like the, the state's version of the House of Representatives. So out of the 99 seats in that state body, uh, they only got 39, even though the Democrats won 53% of the vote. It's a very strong majority. Nationwide, uh, Democrats won a plurality of total congressional votes that year, but uh, failed to win control of the House, of course. And to take a more recent example, uh, in this most recent election uh, in North Carolina, uh, if you look at the state level House, for example, Democrats won a majority of the votes uh, in, in the races in those, uh, in those legislative seats, uh, but they won a minority, 55 out of 120 seats, okay? And, okay, when you see these results, I mean, the first reaction is what's causing this, and so, so we said, you know, uh, there's no guarantee of proportionality because these people are chosen in these single district uh, elections, right? These winner-take-all elections. And so somehow these districts have to matter, and so this is uh, the map of Pennsylvania uh, that was used from 2010 to 2016. Um, and you notice some funny things about it. So the most uh, infamous district in this map is this District uh, 7 here. Um, it's been called the, the Goofy Kicking Donald Duck District. So this is like, I'm goofy here, my ears are flying back, and I'm kicking Donald Duck over on the other side. So that's, that's the image you're supposed to have. And uh, uh, right, so it's, it's very funny looking. And you ask, so how could you end up with a district looking like this? Why would this ever happen? Okay, well, as you can imagine, the southeastern part of uh, Pennsylvania, close to Philadelphia, has a lot of Democratic leading precincts. And let's just conduct a thought experiment. Suppose you were charged with drawing a Republican district in that region. Well, there will be some precincts in this region which lean Republican, and by carefully cobbling them together into a connected region, you could build some sort of district possibly that would overall lean Republican. And when you did that, it might look weird. It might look like this. And you could imagine that you know, this is how you could get districts like this. Um, and so gerrymandering uh, we'll define it as roughly this. So it's sort of sitting down and trying to intentionally draw a map to optimize some partisan goal, OK? And let me emphasize that this is different. I'm not talking about sort of fairness in terms of this sort of like partisan symmetry that we heard about before. So in this talk, the, the problem that we're trying to solve is you know, figuring out when we can tell that somebody has intentionally drawn a map uh, to, to be biased uh, in a partisan way. OK, so uh, we actually have a new map in Pennsylvania that was used in the 2018 election and will be used again in 2020. So there was a lawsuit uh, that I, I was an expert witness in that changed this map. So now we have, this is the new map of Pennsylvania. 
Uh, this is the lawsuit that was filed. And um, yeah, and so uh, what I'll tell you about is the kind of evidence that you can bring using math and statistics in cases like this, okay? So uh, when you first hear about this kind of gerrymandering uh, and, and you know, these examples, and especially when you see the, the results of the elections that I put, put up at the beginning, you could wonder, like, why do we really need to do anything sophisticated here, right? If I look at this old map, it had this completely insane property that in a split election, in a 50-50 split, Democrats only won five seats. And it seems like that should already perhaps be de facto evidence that the map was gerrymandered, and it should be sufficient to just throw it out. You shouldn't need to get any, you know, do any more fancy analysis. The problem with this is that it can have false positives, right? So, uh, for example, uh, if I draw a random districting of Pennsylvania into 18 regions, so here I've just had a computer program, I'm going to put it in quotes, but randomly district Pennsylvania into 18 regions, okay? So this map, in a, if I simulate a historical election in Pennsylvania with, where there's a 50-50 split, gives the Democrats more seats, but still only seven. So even with this randomly drawn map of Pennsylvania, that nobody tried to gerrymander for the Republicans, the Republicans have a significant advantage, okay? And what this means, what this shows you, is that just looking at the result of the election and seeing that one party has an advantage in a split election is not enough to conclude that that party intentionally drew the map to favor their interests, because they didn't draw this map. I drew this map on a computer that didn't know anything about the partisan data when it drew the map, okay? So, so you can't just look at election results. That's, that's the takeaway here. Okay, the next thing you might say is, well, when we had this districting before, I mean, the shapes were ridiculous. We had Goofy here. I mean, surely that's evidence of something. And uh, I'm not saying that that's evidence of nothing, but you have to be careful. And so we saw some reasons for this before, but let me just give some more examples of this. Um, so when the Pennsylvania Supreme Court threw out uh, the old map, they invited submissions for new maps. And these three maps, A, B, and C, were among the submissions that were made to the court as proposed replacements for the map. And when you look at these submissions, I think it's hard to just eyeball them and say that, you know, any of them are clearly visually better than the others, okay? But two of these submissions were made by a computer program that just was using nonpartisan criteria when it was drawing maps. And the third one uh, was drawn by the Republican legislature of Pennsylvania, the same legislature that had drawn the gerrymandered map, and is again a 513 map. It's essentially as bad as the map it was replacing. It just has nice districts. And so it's this, this is the gerrymandered one, and B and C are these, quote, neutral ones. But I would say it's hard to tell just from the shape, okay? So, right, so as a result, we, we have this cautious approach, which is we're not going to infer gerrymandering just from the results of individual elections. We're not going to infer it from the shapes of districts, okay? Instead, what we're going to try to do is infer gerrymandering uh, when we can make a claim that a district is carefully crafted for partisan bias in a way that we actually want to be able to give rigorous false positive rates for our tests. Okay, so we're gonna des describe a statistical test of districting and, and try to prove a rigorous false positive rate for it, okay? So the method is based on making small random changes to a districting. So here what you see is this districting of Wisconsin to 99 districts. And here I've made a small random change to it. So does anybody see the small random change? It's, it's right there, okay? So what did I do? I took a little geographic unit on the boundary of two districts and I changed this membership, okay? And you could, and you choose which, which thing to change uniformly at random among all possibilities, okay? And let's see if it, well, is it gonna work? Come on. No, no. Oh, it's the technology. Okay, I'll try to play this video again at the end when I close the, the thing, but for now, let me not interrupt it. So this would be a video of a bunch of these random changes being made over and over again, okay? And the idea is we make a lot of these changes. And when you make these random changes, uh, you, want them, you don't wanna uh, just make any change. For example, when you make a random change, you wanna keep the districts connected. Maybe you wanna only make changes that preserve some constraint on the population deviation, et cetera. So here, these are hypothetical things that you can constrain, okay? And, uh, right, so really what you're doing with, when you define this, uh, these random changes, you're defining a Markov chain, if you know what that is, on the space of district things. Right, so the transition matrix of this Markov chain is given by these, you know, these probabilities that you'll make certain changes to each districting, right? And so what you're doing as you make this sequence of random changes to your map is you're walking around the space of possible districtings of the state, okay? Now, um, in the case of Wisconsin, for example, uh, you can do this and you can make a sequence of a trillion changes to the map, 
where you preserve a lot of uh, features of the map. So for example, when in this Wisconsin analysis, any town which is currently preserved by the districting always is preserved by the districting. So the maps you get will always be pretty similar to the map you started with for that reason. But still what you observe is that out of the trillions of districts of Wisconsin that you see, only this fraction of maps are as partisan as the enacted map that you started with. So you started with the actual map of Wisconsin. You measured how partisan it is, let's say, by how many, Demo how many Democratic seats are won with that map. And then you conducted this sequence of random changes. Okay, and so you produced a trillion maps like that. And the vast, vast majority of them were all fairer than the enacted map. Only .000, I'm bad at counting zeros, too. That fraction of those trillions of maps were as bad as the enacted map. Okay, now, so this seems like a nice test for gerrymandering. Let's start with the districting, make a sequence of random changes to it. If it consistently gets fair, then it's gerrymandered. Okay, but you should react with skepticism. Could I have false positives? Right, because at the very beginning of the talk, we talked about a natural test for gerrymandering. Just look at the election results. If they don't match up with the seat results, call that gerrymandered. And the problem with that test is it had false positives. If I drew a random map, that test might call it gerrymandered. Okay? So, right, this was our random map. This map still looks, it looks gerrymandered from the seat count, right, because you can have a 7-11 split in seats, even with a 50-50 vote split. Could it also fail this test I've just described? So, could it be that even random districts of a state have some partisan bias, which consistently gets better when you make random changes to it? That's what it would mean to fail this test, okay? And it turns out that's not possible. Okay, so we have a theorem that says that's not the case. We can uh, prove that and quantify exactly the extent to which, it's, to, to which it's possible. So the basic message there is that if I start with some typical thing, it won't be changed in a consistent way by a sequence of random changes. Right, so if that's what I, if, if I observe that for a districting, if I start with a districting and I make a sequence of random changes to it, and I observe the partisanship consistently changes, well then I didn't start with a typical map, I started with a very strange one. And so this is an example of the theorem. So this is the first theorem that we proved in this area. So suppose I'm given a map. So this is this map X naught. And it's typical, which means it's drawn from the stationary distribution of your Markov chain. So it could just be uniformly random among all the maps that you allow. Okay? And then suppose that you generate the sequence of random maps. That's what this X naught, X1 up to XK is. Okay? From this, from this map that you started at. And then suppose that you observe that this map is in the most extreme epsilon fraction of all the things that you saw. Okay, well if x naught was really typical, then the probability of this happening would be at, at most root two epsilon. So this really gives you a p-value for this experiment under the null hypothesis that you were given a typical map. Okay, and so uh, now you have this simple intuitive test for gerrymandering. You, you conduct uh, the sequence of random changes to the boundary line. You see if the partisanship consistently changes, and you have a p-value for the test. And then, so this is what we applied in the Pennsylvania case. Uh, there are, I think, some, uh, you know, there, there were always some issues uh, that you could, when you first see this, that you, might, uh, that you might have with this test. So one funny thing about this is that it seems like it has a strong null hypothesis, right? It assumes that the map is random. And obviously the maps aren't random, uh, right? So what we want to say is, is not just that the map is non-random, but that it was really, really carefully drawn, right? Another issue is that uh, it seems like the output of this is just significance. Right, so you can get a very small p-value when your epsilon is small, but so the idea is that when you observe a very small epsilon, it gives you a very, a very good significance level, but you don't actually quantify the effect size separately from that. And a third issue, which is just a technical issue, which is kind of funny, is that there's not a good way to use parallelism with this test. I can't conduct the test a second time and conclude anything extra because there's two sources of randomness in this theorem. First, there's the randomness in the, the assumption that x naught is typical, that is drawn from the stationary distribution, and then there's the randomness in the sequence. And conducting a second test only resamples that second type of randomness, not the first. So you can't conclude anything from multiple runs. Okay, so we have a more recent uh, paper with another theorem of this type that allows uh, better statements in response to these issues. So first I'm gonna define what it means to be, to, to, first I'm gonna define how one can measure how carefully crafted a districting is. So suppose I have a, a districting of a state, and I wanna quantify how carefully crafted it is. I wanna attach a number to it that measures that, hypothetically, okay? Well, one way to define that is to just measure it by the probability that the partisanship of that districting would change in a consistent way when I made random changes to it. So this is not something I can actually measure about a districting in practice, but I can define this number. So for each districting that has some number which is the probability 
that if I made a sequence of random changes, that its partisanship would be in the most extreme fraction. Okay? So that's a, that's a number that's attached to each district. Okay? And so when that number's high, it, it's supposed to mean that it's more carefully crafted. So we have a, this is the more recent theorem. Suppose that somebody gives me a map again, so they give me an x naught, and I generate this random sequence of maps. Okay? What this theorem says, I don't have to assume now that they gave me a random map. All I have to assume is that x naught is not among the weirdest alpha fraction of all maps with respect to how carefully crafted it is. So this theorem says, unless that's the case, unless you were given a map that's among the alpha most carefully crafted fraction of maps with respect to that definition, then the probability that this is among the most extreme epsilon fraction in some trajectory is at most some other, some other equation, right? So at most root two epsilon over alpha, okay? And so the point of this theorem, well, there's a couple points. So first, we have a, a milder assumption. Now we don't have to assume that we were given a random map. All we're saying is as long as you gave me a map that wasn't among the alpha worst fraction of maps, okay, then I can conclude this. Another thing to notice is that here, that now there's only one type of randomness, because the assumption is a deterministic one. There's, the only type of randomness in this theorem is in, with respect to this sequence. So you can redo this test. So in particular, if you do this test t times, the probability that it's in the most extreme epsilon fraction among all t trajectories is at most 2 epsilon over alpha to the t over 2. In particular, the fact that you're taking the square root now doesn't matter. And in particular, no matter what epsilon is, you can get a very small p-value by doing repeated tests. And what changes is just what alpha you, you get that for. So even if I have a district which is, let's say, only a 1% outlier, what this theorem lets you do is determine that it's really a 1% outlier at a very good level of statistical significance, okay, which is with the previous results wouldn't have been possible. Okay, so for the, with the previous results, you can only really be sure about things when they were really extreme. Now you can be sure about things even when they're less extreme. Okay, so let me, uh, right, so this is what I said. So let me give an example. So there's, this is a more, more recent lawsuit. So this was in North Carolina um, where they were challenging the districts, the state level House and Senate districts in North Carolina. So this was a case that just happened over the summer. Uh, so this is an example of the Senate map of North Carolina. So one interesting thing, what are we down to? Three and a half. Three and a half, okay. So one interesting thing about the districts, uh, the districts in North Carolina is that they have this rule that essentially divides the state in a deterministic way into clusters of counties, which are then districted completely independently. So you'll have a cluster of five counties whose population is basically eight times an ideal district so uh, size, and then you just district these five counties into eight districts completely independent of everything else. And as a result, the districting problem decomposes into these completely separate problems, uh, which are much smaller. And for some of those examples, you find, like we did in Wisconsin, for some clusters, you find the districting is, you know, at 10 to the minus 9 outlier, some very extreme thing. But for a lot of the small clusters, what you find is just they're very consistently 2 or 3 percent outliers, which means that, you know, as a whole, as a collection of 15 or 20 clusters, they conspire to make the combination of them at 10 to the minus 10 or whatever outlier. But reaching this conclusion on a cluster-by-cluster -cluster basis requires you to be able to be confident about even mild, milder levels of the, how much these are an outlier. Uh, so yeah, so that's the, that's the uh, motivation for this, uh, for this new theorem. So I have, yeah, so I think, yeah, so I'm, I have some uh, analogy, but I think I should just stop now so we have plenty of time. You wanna try your video? Uh, oh, that's right, the video, I forgot about the video. Let's try the video. Okay, turn this off. Okay. Uh. Okay, so yeah, this is the this is the video of this district in Wisconsin. I mean, so here, like, there's something like maybe 100 or so changes being made a second, but many of them are too small to see because many of these boards are actually very small. Okay, and this video is running like thousands of times slower than our actual algorithm. Thank you. The video is running thousands of times slower than our actual algorithm, right? So to watch the entire algorithm run at this speed would take like something like 10,000 years, okay? Uh, and nevertheless, after two minutes of the video, the disk strings have become fair than the initial districting, so that in the remaining 10,000 years, you would never again see one as favorable to the Republicans as the first one. So that's an astonishing level 
of being an extreme outlier, right? So at the, it's just at the very beginning of this trajectory, when the maps still look almost exactly the same as the first map. But it turns out this first map was so carefully crafted that you've already wiggled the lines enough to destroy uh, the partisanship. And actually, so there's just one more video in the same directory I can show. So this is the same thing being just shown at a faster speed for one of the county clusters of the Senate in North Carolina. Um, so here, it's another one of these things where you'd have to watch the video for like a thousand years. And um, so, you know, one thing that, you know, this is, you know, something you can tell the judges in this case is that I think it's after three or four frames of the video, you never again see a map as favorable to the Republicans as the first map. So it's really, you've swapped like one or two or three precincts and the game is over. It's already fairer than, a, than the initial map and will never again be as unfair. So, uh, right, so, they, so we have all this math that makes this rigorous, but at some, sometimes, you know, when it comes down to it, these videos and just how stark the numbers are is, I think, what's, what you, is really convincing. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so while he's setting up the next talk, um, clarifying questions for Wes? Adam? The theorem statement. Yeah, so in the theorems, the, so the theorems about arbitrary reversible Markov chains, where you have some arbitrary way that you're labeling the states of the Markov chain. So, so and sorry. So in our case, this sorry, in our case, this label function might just be something like the number of seats the Democrats won, or it could be some more complicated score for the election. But the theorem holds, no, so no matter how you label the states of the Markov chain, it has this property that a typical state shouldn't see a, a consistent change. So in your simulations, it was like the number of seats by one party. Uh, in, the, yeah. in the Wisconsin example, it's the number of seats. In, uh, in the North Carolina example, we used something where you account for uniform swings of the vote. You imagine, like, suppose the vote was perturbed by a random uniform swing from some distribution. What would be the expected number of seats each party would win to, right, to see how this is just supposed to be more robust to slight changes in the data. Yeah. Okay, um, our next speaker is Bridget Tenner um, from DePaul in Chicago, who will tell us about ranked choice voting and how to represent it. Thank you. Can, does this work? Do I have the height okay? Well, if I don't, just, you know, do that. Um, so, first of all, thank you, Moon, for inviting me, and thank you to the founders and creators of this exciting opportunity that everybody's getting to learn about. I'm gonna talk about a different stage in all of this. And uh, so my background is that I'm a combinatorialist. I like discrete objects. I like counting and sorting things, and I like games and puzzles. And I like to think of these problems as discrete problems, and so Moon and I do a lot of talking about that kind of thing. But I'm actually gonna talk to you now about something a bit different. All right, there we go. So I want to talk to you about visualizing and communicating data in alternative voting systems. And I, I think that this is an appropriate choice to talk about at the moment where we're founding a new journal. And so we might all be interested in various aspects of data science and computation or the ramifications of this and applications, but we do want to be able to talk about it to other people and we want them to understand it, which I think is a lofty but very important goal. And so that's where I'm coming at this from. So, oh, and this is joint work with Greg Warrington, who's at the University of Vermont and is also a combinatorialist. So you're having an election. Congratulations. What does that mean? Well, there are a few things. First, there's some kind of vote happening. Then some sort of magic happens to make it so that somebody wins. And then we announce the results. And this is very, you know, broad strokes here, but this is roughly what happens in an election, and it's that third step that's really important. And so how does this happen? In lots of ways, there might be discussions and publications, and the piece that I wanna talk about is that uh, often, you can imagine, uh, election results are being described graphically. And you've seen this, and you like this, because you like really pretty, data, graphics, pictures, you, we've had many of them today. 
uh, not about elections necessarily, but this is really important, and it's becoming, um, let's say, really prevalent, and people are being very fancy and polished with it, and we should do a good job of it. So what should an election graphic do? And I, I want to take a moment to highlight a few things, and, and some of them might not seem like a grand request, but it's important to write it down. So I think an election graphic should be easy to understand. Okay. I also think it should clearly indicate a winner. Now we get a little more interesting. I think it should reflect the, the methodology of the election procedure. Okay, so if you're thinking, well, we'll come back to that example in a minute. So it should reflect the methodology of the election procedure. That's kind of the black box bit. We've cast our votes and then the something happened. And I think that the graphic should give some support to whatever it is that happened. And it should also summarize the votes that were cast. I would call these modest goals. And why do we care about these in particular? Well, the first two are kind of obvious. So any graphical depiction of data should be easy to understand. That's the whole point, so people can read it. And the point of an election is to select a winner, and maybe multiple winners. I'm going to speak in terms of single winner elections, but you can rephrase this. Now, the second uh, half of that list is a little different. So, Moon, can you lean down? I can't see. Can you? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, reflecting the tally procedure and summarizing the ballots that were cast can serve a a range of what I'm going to call consumers. So these are people who are interested in it. And I think these are two really important points. So first of all, if you're the voter, you want to believe in the way that the winner was determined, right? You want to think there was some kind of integrity to this procedure and that you made informed decisions when you cast your votes. And the other thing is that I think it's, um, it's important for candidates to understand who supports them, OK? Not just the number of people who support them, who cheer wildly for them at every opportunity. This is very well organized. Um, but there, there might be something more subtle going on. I really, I genuinely don't know what's happening next door. I, I thought it, organized this just for your talk. I did. <laughs> it's taken months of planning, funding, all of it. Uh, <laughs> And um, so there are sometimes, and we'll get to this example in a minute, there might be some kind of more subtle issue of coalition support that a candidate would want to understand. So these are our goals. And I would call them modest, because I think we could certainly come up with huger goals. And we're not going to. OK, so keep these four things in mind. All right, so here's the first step. A plural in plurality elections, this is easy. Okay, so I should be clear, in a plurality voting system, each voter casts a single ballot, or names a single candidate on their ballot, and we add those up, and whoever has the highest pile or the largest number at the end is the winner. Okay, very straightforward. And a bar chart gets the job done. You could certainly be fancier, but you could also just do something like this, and you'd be done. I was asked to use real data in this talk. I think we can agree this is real. Um, no, I will use real data in a little bit. I don't know. It is in my household. It's real. Um, but we can, we'll use real data in a minute. But the point is that plurality elections, there's nothing really interesting to talk about. In fact, my uh, third and fourth bullet points, which are kind of the more interesting ones, aren't exactly an issue in a plurality election. And so that's great, except we do other things. And that's what I want to use as kind of the running example for the rest of this talk. Because we can be very used to communicating certain kinds of data and, and applications and results and questions about them. But as soon as it gets a little bit more complicated, we have to adjust what we do and how we talk about it. OK, so here's my example. This is ranked choice voting and instant runoff voting, RCV and IRV. These elections are much more challenging to describe and to display. So a ranked choice vote 
is when I get to go to the ballot box and I get to list candidates that I like, and I list them in order from top choice to bottom choice. So this is not approval voting, this is literally a ranked list. And there can be subtleties, like maybe you can rank at most five people, or maybe you have to rank the entire list, or maybe you can have a partial ballot and just list as many as you want. But the idea is ranked list. Okay, so that's the way I'm casting my vote. But then there's this second stage where the votes actually get tallied, and there are multiple ways to do that. The one that I wanna focus on is instant runoff. So in IRV, the way that votes get tallied is we take in these ranked choice votes and we do an iterative procedure. <laughs> so the, in, the iterative procedure works like this. We look at the first, the top ranked choice of each ballot and we write it down and we tally things up. Who was in top place? If there were only two candidates, then the person who has the most votes is the winner and we're done. But if there were more than two candidates, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna say, okay, who got the least, the fewest in that tally? Candidate X did, okay, so I'm just gonna say candidate X is out at this point. I'm gonna cross that name off of every single ballot and then I will restart the procedure. So if you are candidate Y and you got a vote during that round, well, you're gonna get that same vote again, but you might actually get more votes now that X has been removed if X was above you. This is often actually described with a step one and a half that Greg and I both dislike for various reasons. And that says, um, if any tally has the majority of votes, then you're done. Just pick that person as the winner, which is true. You're gonna end up with the same winner. Um, without that step, we run this for a little bit longer. It takes a few more you know, rounds to get to a winner, but it actually provides a huge amount of information. So we encourage not truncating too soon. So this is a kind of election, and you can tell that it's a lot more subtle than a plurality election, and it has kind of a lot more going on. So there are a few stages of it that are more interesting, and first of all, the voting is more interesting, so I, as a voter, have to think really quite carefully about how I want to Think about all the candidates, how, you know, at some point we had 24 <coughs> candidates in the Democratic primary. I could be thinking of all 24 and making a list of them. It also certainly affects the way people campaign if they're not just running for the only vote that you get to cast. So there's a lot going on on that side. And also the tallying is obviously more complex and there are issues of how to communicate that to voters and educate the voters. But there's a piece of it that exists in this sort of election that does not exist in plurality. And that's what uh, we call the pedigree of a vote. So the pedigree of a particular vote that candidate X gets in a certain round is telling where that vote came from. So maybe first you voted for A and then B and then C and then X, and A and B and C all got eliminated and so now your vote has sort of maneuvered its way to candidate X. But we would call the pedigree the A, B, C, and X, kind of this ordered list of how it got there. And I think you can make an interesting argument for why that matters in uh, an election uh, conducted under this procedure. So if you're candidate X and you end up winning, you might like to know that some of your voters came from over there. And so if you wanna get reelected, you have to remember that some of them actually liked candidate A quite a bit. And so think about why they did and how that could influence your policy making. Okay, so let's just see how well this has been done. So I told you plurality is easy. And now we're gonna to get to real data that's not about cheese. And so how have elections like this been reported in the media? Well, first of all, this sort of electoral system happens in many, many places, including here in Cambridge. And so let's see an example. And I, uh, yes, it's Maine. Maine was the first time that it was on kind of a federal scale. It was the congressional district, Maine's second congressional district in 2018 was run on this sort of election. So how is this data reported? So for that particular election, many news outlets that I will not name at this moment uh, conveyed the results like this, sort of. I mean, I made the table, but essentially there were three columns and one was a list of names. And then the second one was the list of first round votes 
that those people got? And then there was like, blah, 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 magic happened, and we have a final answer. And so I didn't, I mean, this, if I wanted to, to construct a table to make you see how interesting this was, it would look like this. Because in the first round votes, the person who got the most is not the person who ends up as the winner. Okay, so if you take a moment to look at this. So the fourth name there got eliminated first, and the votes were redistributed, and then Bond got eliminated, and those votes were redistributed, and then the final answer is over there. Now, if you look at this, and you're just an ordinary consumer of the newspaper, and you see this, you might well think, I don't, I don't quite get it. Why are these numbers flip-flopping? And where was my vote? How, I don't know, you know, there's like a lot of questions that are not, not at all clear from this. Um, and so this is where Greg and I thought we should fix that. Because if we're gonna talk about numbers, we should do it correctly. So here's our proposal. We like the idea of something called an accumulation chart. So this is motivated by the fact that candidates are accumulating votes during each round. Right, you get the ones you had last time and maybe some new ones from whoever we just crossed out. Okay, well, if we can illustrate that accumulation, then maybe we can do it in a way that shows the methodology of the procedure, maybe even summarizes the votes that were cast. And if we can do this using something like a bar chart, then it's already easy to understand. And you know, the longest bar indicates the winner, just as usual. And there's an added bonus that if we do this in a certain way, we can actually also indicate the coalition of support for any candidate by, by drawing in the pedigrees of all the votes that get added in at each point. So let me give you the example. This is from the 2018 election of Maine's 2nd Congressional District, and this is the accumulation chart. So, this is all that same data put in. And what we see is that the longest bar goes to Golden, who was in fact declared the winner. Poliquin was sort of the second place or was the last person eliminated and so on. And I think, I think this will work. Yeah, so this big dark purple bar is the number of votes that Golden got in the first round. And then there's this sliver here that's kind of orange on top and purple on, their on the bottom. And that's votes that were first cast for whore and then got transferred to golden after the first elimination, and so on. So in the, I wanna highlight this last chunk here. Once bond is eliminated, votes that move over to golden can actually look like three different things. So you could have said bond and then golden, or bond and then whore and then golden, or whore and then bond and then golden, and all three of those appear there. And so if you look at this, now we see right away who wins. If I just want to understand the winner, I look for just the longest bar. I can uh, understand the coalition of support. If I am golden, I can say, oh, you know, there's a big chunk of my voters that actually liked bond a lot. So I should remember that next time I'm running. Or even if you didn't win, if you're a poliquin, you might look at your own coalition of support and think about that for a future election. And as a voter, if I had my ranking in a certain way, I can see exactly where my vote moved to at each round of the election. So there are some ways to simplify this if you want, and some options that Greg and I have been playing with a lot. And so one is, do you want to de-emphasize the round one results? So this is something Greg and I tossed back and forth a lot. So the idea of listing the, the round one results and highlighting them, as many of these news outlets did, is understandable, but also sort of silly. Like in a race, if you're winning after the first lap, that does not mean you're going to win in any way. And so if you want to de-emphasize that, you could shuffle the order from left to right. Like you could have your round one and then round two, and then round three, or something. You know, you could kind of rearrange things if you want to de-emphasize something like that. If you want to ignore lower tier candidates, uh, for example, if you're in an election that has 27 candidates running, that can be quite a long chart to read, but you might truncate in a certain way. Uh, you can also 
kind of simplify the coloring. Oh, I'm sorry, if you want to see thin slivers, if it's getting too crowded on there, if you display electronically, you can certainly zoom. And if you are not interested in following the pedigree but want to simplify the coloring, of course, that's an option too. I mean, there are many ways to play with this, but the idea is that if we want to think about the point of communicating data, we should make sure we're understanding how people want to use it and interpret it. And for example, something like RCV and IRV is, is a good thing to be playing with. And speaking of playing with it, um, Greg has made this, there we go, really cool um, kind of tool on his website. And I, oh, I was told it was going to work, but I don't know how to do it now. Well, it worked when I practiced it. OK, at the end. Anyway, these will be available somewhere. Or if you go to Greg's website, you can find it. But it's really cool because you actually, he has, a, I don't know, five or six different options for real data, including a recent Massachusetts or Cambridge race where it's um, multi-winner districts, or, you know, kind of seeing how that can happen in some of these things and experimenting. And there are some neat tools there. So that's what we're working on. Thank you. While we're, while we're switching, any clarifying questions for Bridget? So uh, another option would be Sankey diagrams? Yeah, so uh, thank you. He's asking about Sankey diagrams, which show uh, a flow in a really good way. And I like them a lot. They're, they're not used very often, surprisingly. Bridget, could you use your mic? He's asking about Sankey diagrams, which is another option that shows um, how votes can flow in a certain way, and they are surprisingly not used very often for this sort of thing. Um, I, we like them a lot. I th there are certain things that I find hard to follow through in them. There are reasons they're not quite my favorite, but I like them a lot more than these like three column tables, certainly. Thank you. Yes. Some people submit partial ballots. So you might like bond a lot and hate the rest. And, and some people just list bond four times, right? So there are ways of just sort of voicing your support. Yeah, thank you. That was a very good catch. <laughs> I appreciate the, the checking. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, what I'd like to do is, is try to take um, the really interesting material from those talks, bring it together into um, a discussion at a pretty zoomed out level of how to take all this kind of information into account. So I'm gonna have a slightly different framing from what uh, you've heard so far. Um, so what you know about me so far is I introduced myself as a mathematician. Mark Hansen has told you I really care about scale. Dustin has told you I really care about units, so I must be a data scientist, right? Um, and I'm going to try to illustrate that by thinking about how all of this data can actually be practically impactful on different parts of the process. And you've heard a little bit about litigation, and I also want to talk about map adoption before you have to get sued. Um, so I'm going to try to do a little bit of that as I bring things together. Okay, so what have we heard so far? So um, from Dustin, you've heard that you can't have everything you want. We all maybe knew that already. So there are impossibility theorems, of course, in social choice that go back to the 1950s, and now we have impossibility theorems for redistricting. I'm just giving you some icons to jog your memory of what kind of thing that looks like. And then we heard from Wes that, hey, there's some good news. You can use algorithms, in particular Markov chains, and maybe Markov chain Monte Carlo, MCMC, to understand the space, that universe of possibilities. And what this does for you, arguably, is it gives you kind of a vista on gerrymandering by saying, I did this, but what else could I have done? It gives you this kind of relevant counterfactual of the actual alternatives, right? And if you can sample effectively from the space of possibilities, uh, then you're in good position to be able to talk about things relative to actual alternatives. And so here you see a lot of Pennsylvanias that look pretty close because the flips that you saw were happening one small unit at a time. 
Uh, and then you heard from Bridget that you can be creative about how you present the data. So in particular, we saw ranked choice and accumulation diagrams happening as a way to um, tell people about what happened. And there are all kinds of benefits, civic benefits, that Bridget talked about for that. OK. So I'm going to, as I said, try to bring all of these together in a zoomed out narrative about where we are now in redistricting reform and maybe where we're going. Um, and I'm going to try to tell a hopeful story about how all of this mathematical, computational, statistical intervention is moving the needle, because uh, I'm an optimist about that, actually. OK, but first, the bad news. <laughs> so the bad news, as I hope we've convinced you, is that, in particular, the redistricting problem is hard, but it's maybe even harder. It's maybe even harder than you thought if you already thought it was hard. Next, um, there are a host of classical metrics, um, but some of those are really flawed, problematic, or they have an interpretive gap between the metric and the fairness ideal that it's trying to access. Um, you have to work with them anyway in some cases just because they're traditional. Um, and we heard about that in the uh, guise of compactness scores. And I'm also going to talk about that coming back to Xiao Li's question from earlier in these partisan fairness metrics themselves. Right? Those are metrics as well. Um, and, some, and many of them have interpretive issues. Urban legends, gut facts, and trendy metrics uh, can really actually obstruct reform, can get in the way of reform. And I'm going to show you some cautionary tales for uh, what that can look like. Uh, and I'd like to try to convince you that actual um, legal language is being introduced. We're in a reform moment around the country when many states are changing their rules. They're re-examining their rules. That's the good part. They're reflecting about their rules. They're writing new rules into law and into constitutions. But the scary thing is that some of this actual legal language being enacted is being advanced with what I'm calling here major booby traps. And I'm going to try to show you ways that this language is backfiring or creating new problems. OK. Um, so um, in aggregate, you know, from a very zoomed out point of view, when you're thinking about these various kinds of metrics, um, one of the points I want to make is that people have this mental image. right? So I'm using efficiency gap uh, just as one example of a metric that's been popular in the last few years. Who here has heard of efficiency gap? A few hands, great. OK, so this is a partisan fairness metric that's been introduced in the last few years. Dustin alluded to another family of metrics called partisan symmetry metrics. This is an alternative. Um, all of these are just, um, they, they stew together um, some of the party favoring vote shares and seat shares, and they come up with a metric that's supposed to tell you um, how fair or how symmetric the election was. And I don't think there is any gospel on what fairness looks like, but these metrics are nonetheless trying to quantify it so that you can quantify a failure of fairness. The problem is that you might have this image in mind. You might think nature loves a bell curve, and in the absence of nefarious intents, should be centered at zero. Right? If it's a signed measure with each party advantage on one side, then if we're not trying to do anything to take special advantage of the situation, maybe zero is normal and all we have to do is cut off the tails. And the reality is more complicated. So this is an actual plot of the efficiency gaps you see in the background in gray that you can observe over a giant Markov chain ensemble in Pennsylvania um, against some stewed together vote data with a number of actual maps shown here in stripes. OK, so what's the picture saying? Um, well, it's saying a few things. One thing it's saying is that if you want to understand a map, you better understand it um, in relation to actual alternatives. And the second thing to observe here is where zero is. You see it? I marked it over there. <laughs> Not in the middle. Um, and that comes back to a point you've heard already today, which is that um, the, the, geography, the political geography itself, where people live, uh, can give you a tilted playing field, and you have to measure the tilt, right? Um, and so part of the picture that emerges from these ensemble techniques, techniques where you use algorithms to generate large samples and hopefully representative samples of the world of possibilities, um, if, you wanna, if, you, if you use those, then you can understand whether something's an outlier with respect to the counterfactual of not trying to do a thing, right? If that makes sense. Okay, so. Good. So, this leads to the good news. So what is the good news? I claim 
that independent commissions, which are being established around the country at a rate we haven't seen ever, um, good government groups, courts, asterisk, and even elected officials are listening to mathematicians. Asterisk there, Supreme Court, not convinced, <laughs> right? Um, but all kinds of other federal courts and state courts are finding this evidence to be extremely persuasive. Um, so these ensemble methods uh, can be used affirmatively. I think this is part of the good news. Not only to challenge a map or to say, aha, I've caught you, you were gerrymandering, but to um, give positive blessing or affirmation to a map before it's enacted that it behaves as though selected only by the stated rules. That's the power of a method like this. Um, not only can it be used in that sense to show that a map isn't an outlier in the universe of alternatives, but also ensemble methods, and I'll tour you through how this looks, can be used for criteria testing. I'll, I'll give you some examples, not just for lawsuits. Okay, so the, in summary, the good news is as data science and data communication around map assessment and election science matures, um, we're in a position to have a major positive impact. All right, so you already heard an example from Wes, so here's Pennsylvania. Um, so Wes was uh, an expert witness for the plaintiffs in the case in Pennsylvania, that's in, in state court, that successfully challenged the map. And I played a different role in that case. I was a consulting expert for the governor with two roles. On one hand, to consider any map that would be proposed by the legislature in the remedial process, and perhaps help advise a veto or signature of that map. But also, and here's the part that I think is a little bit different, um, the, the governor's own team had a map maker, and the governor wanted a, you know, upfront assessment of that map before putting it forward. Does that make sense? Right, so it's not only um, an adversarial model, but also a kind of best practices model of understanding your own map before you advance it. Okay, so that the uh, framing reminder for uh, the rest of what I want to say. Okay, so now what I want to do in the time that I have left is give you an example blitz. Okay, so I'm going to show you a lot of images as I do that, and each of these is attached to either a publication or a preprint that you can see, you can get from uh, my group's website, mggg.org, maybe I should write that down later. Um, but in case you want any details, and, and so I don't get yelled at about not including scales and units on the slide, um, uh, this is available to look at. Okay, ready for the blitz? Here's a high-level tour. In Virginia, here's a question you can ask about the rules themselves. You can ask, if I tried not to split counties and cities, would that drive bad shapes in the manner that uh, Dustin was talking about before? Is there a tension between splitting roles and compactness? Does this question make sense? Okay. Um, and here's a partial answer to that. So what you see on this slide, for both on the left, the congressional map, and on the right, the state senate, what you see is an ensemble analysis, so a big Markov chain drawing, lots and lots of plans. And in gray, I ignore county and city splitting, and in pink, I pay a lot of attention to it. So, you see what I'm saying? Okay, and what's being measured here is the number of cut edges in the plan, which is a, a metric of compactness, with better shaped things to the left. So what is this picture telling you? It's telling you a story, and it's a nice one. It's saying that paying more attention to the integrity of counties and cities actually caused your shapes to look nicer. It's just telling you that in quantified form. Okay, make sense? Next example, Alaska. All right, this is gonna be a tour of the whole country. <laughs> um, okay, so in Alaska, let's ask a different question. This was a question we got from a sitting Anchorage assemblyman. He called us up and he said, here in Alaska, we have this rule that the state house, which has 40 districts, and the state senate, which has 20 districts, are formed by two to one nesting. Okay, so you have the house districts, the 40 house districts, upper left, that's a dual graph of the house districts. And then I just have to pair adjacent ones to form the senate districts, that's the rule. Okay, well, Alaska has a lot of water, you might have noticed if you've looked at it lately. And so one question that you have to ask to do this is what counts as being next to what? Because you want your districts to be contiguous. Okay, so we hedged our bets and, and came up with three different models of adjacency. A tighter one, a restricted one, a permissive one. They're not that different from each other, 
It seems like a small variation. So by the way, as I, as the, I carry on the analysis, I'll incidentally be testing contiguity rules. And so I hope the picture that's emerging is that you can model all of these rule interactions. OK, so what did we find? So this is kind of fun. The world of districting plans for any districting problem you are likely to encounter is far too big to enumerate completely. It's what we call ginormous, right? Um, but this far, far constrained problem, you can count exactly. So it turns out, how many ways are there to pair those 40 house districts into Senate districts? Well, with a little linear algebra and 0.022 seconds of computer time, you can count. And it's a kind of a fun answer, which is uh, the number of ways to do it is either 14,000, 29,000, or 108,000, depending on that water adjacency question. Okay, and this is an exact count. This isn't a sample, it's an exact count. And so we did this in all the states that have these nesting rules. And uh, here's a fun one. Minnesota, six times 10 to the 18th ways to make their state senate just from pairing state house districts. Now imagine the full size of the space of possible plans. Okay, and then um, we tried to answer the assemblyman's question. And so here's our attempt to do so. Um, it, it says, well, whether you look at congressional data, which looks like this, or you look at gubernatorial data, which looks like this, you get the exact same picture. And that picture is, yes, that particular Senate pairing cost the Democrats one seat. Okay, so this is the kind of measurement against counterfactuals. Okay. The tour continues. Let's go to Georgia. Um, and in Georgia, you might ask the question, um, is the current map engineered against competitiveness? That's one of the flavors of partisan gerrymandering, of course, is to reduce the number of competitive districts. So here's Georgia's state Senate. And you see here how the Democratic share in the 56 districts in the state Senate is cutting through that band of competitiveness. So the purple band is 45 to 55% share. And the green band is five points in either direction around the statewide average with respect to presidential data from 2016. So that's what the map actually does. And you might think that looks fishy. It cuts pretty quickly through those bands. But if you want to know if that's unusual, you need an ensemble. And this tells you how maps drawn without partisan data perform, and they do spend a rather longer time in that competitiveness band. Okay, so that's another example. Let's look at Missouri. Um, here's a picture. Well, Missouri <laughs> has quite a bit of partisan sorting, as you can see. Can anyone pick out the cities? Good job. Um, what if you were to ask the competitiveness question there? So here I want to return to something I said at the beginning about booby traps. So Missouri is one of five states that put a question to the voters on the ballot last year and in fact passed a constitutional amendment that changed their rules about how redistricting was going to be carried out. And in that amendment, they put two rules that have a partisan character. And they're both, of course, in the name of fairness. One, plans should have an efficiency gap. Remember, I mentioned this score earlier should be close to zero because that is their working definition of partisan fairness. Second rule, in the name of competitiveness, it should stay close to zero when you swing the vote five points in either direction. Because competitiveness should mean that as, it should mean responsiveness. It should mean that as the results change, you stay fair. That was the thinking here, okay? And if you're wondering if that works, it does not. <laughs> um, so you know, in a new preprint, we analyze this, by the way, this, analyzing this particular rule is a matter of eighth grade math. Okay? Um, so a little algebra one will tell you um, that this rule is actually enforcing anti-competitiveness. Oops, right, there's my oops emoji. Um, in other words, to actually follow this rule, you have to have one hyper-competitive district and no others in the 45 to 55% range. Anything else would be declared unacceptable under the new competitiveness rule. I, I think that uh, qualifies as an oops. OK, and then the last example comes back to this partisan symmetry. Um, so what is partisan symmetry? Well, you, know, you heard about an S-curve before, but a little more generally, as Dustin said, partisan symmetry is the idea that if you look at how seats relate to votes, you should get something that's kind of symmetric about 50-50. So here's something that looks pretty partisan symmetric. This is the seats votes curve generated by Oregon voting data from 2016. And if you flip it, you get something not that different. OK, that's what partisan symmetry is supposed to mean. OK, so I'll just close with this example. In Utah, 
the, um, the measure that was passed at the ballot by voters last year wrote partisan symmetry into the rules. So it's now a criterion in Utah. Okay, so um, we wanted to analyze that. First, I'm showing you here, not Utah, but uh, North Carolina, just as a warm up. So in North Carolina, mean median, which is in the family of partisan symmetry scores, uh, here's on top you see an overall histogram of mean median. See how it's not quite a bell curve centered at zero? Okay, but it's maybe not that different. And in red and blue below that, you see the most extreme partisan maps that a computer could find. Okay, so please notice that mean median is doing something good. The, the right direction is Republican favoring. It is correctly telling you that the most Republican favorable maps are the most Republican favoring, right? It's getting that right, where the most Democratic favoring maps are on the other side. That, so far, so good. Unfortunately, right at zero sit a bunch of the most extreme Republican gerrymanders makeable. Okay, so the standard of making the score close to zero is not going to constrain you from making the most extreme Republican gerrymander that you can. You guys get what I'm saying? Okay, and so how's it going, Utah? How's that rule going to play out? Really badly. Here's how the rule plays out in Utah. Let me tell you what you're looking at before you look at it, if that's possible. Um, uh, in Utah, there's four congressional seats, and every single one, uh, every single plan that gives even one Democratic seat shows up as a Republican gerrymander. We call this the Utah paradox. Okay, so Utah is getting partisan symmetry metrics applied to Utah get both things wrong, the existence of a gerrymander and the direction. <laughs> okay, so the, the new rule that Utah just adopted is going to require for partisan fairness testing that there are no Democrats in Congress, which I, I guarantee you was um, not the intent. Okay. Um, happy to answer questions about that preprint available. Okay, actually, I lied. I had one more example to bring us back to Bridget's um, presentation, which is what's going on 45 minutes up the road in Lowell, Massachusetts. So in Lowell, they're going to conduct an election in about three weeks to decide on their system of election. Okay, And that's because they've been sued because of the, the racist way that the city council elects its, uh, that the city council is elected. Um, by racist, I mean the, the system is alleged under the Voting Rights Act to systematically exclude people of color from representation. Okay, And so Lowell gets to choose among two options that the city council has put forth. They can use ranked choice voting, which you heard about from Bridget, or they can use a new districted system for the first time. They've never had districts. They've done a plurality at large election system. And so what I'm showing you here are some images from our new report on Lowell, our group's new report, where we analyze what would happen if they did districts by using a big ensemble of maps, like I've just been telling you. And we use some stochastic modeling to model what might happen under various turnout and crossover voting scenarios if they moved to ranked choice. But I submit to you humbly that the images I've put on this slide are ineffective for communication purposes, <laughs> right? And so um, when we put a public report together, and I just was up in Lowell at a community meeting to talk about this earlier this week, we used not these images, but these images. <laughs> Actually, someone came up to me at the end of the meeting and said, cats, finally I get the stakes, <laughs> which made me very happy. Um, and so the point of this image is to say, if you rank your candidates, you'll get a certain outcome. If those same preferences had been unranked with your old system, you would have an all-cat hegemony, right? A perfect cat sweep. Okay, and so um, in closing, we thought a great deal about the kind of images that you need to explain to people where the candidates will be, who's going to win, what the representation is likely to look like. And if they do shift to this system of election, which is possible, but perhaps not likely, um, then we'll be calling on Bridget to tell us how to render the results. And actually, the question that you posed as a hypothetical was actually asked to me at this meeting, Bridget, um, where people said, well, how, how many times do votes typically move? And everybody at the meeting said, I don't know. Um, so, we, so I said, I know this person, Bridget, <laughs> uh, who can answer that question for you. So this is actually a live question and one that I think will be really important. Okay, so the upshot, just to circle back to where I started, as data science and data communication around map assessment and election science matures, or mature, uh, we are in a position to have a major positive impact. Thanks.
Okay, and now, due to extreme talk discipline by others, <laughs> we actually really do have time for not just clarifying questions. So let's start with that if you have clarifying questions for me. Um, and then we can transition to sort of deeper discussion questions. John? <laughs> all, all the slides are, are available, and I, I would love folks to um, take these on. No problem. Question? Yeah. Uh, I, oh, thank you. This, this was great. This is a great session. And I'm so happy to see that there's a screen at the front, because for the longest time, I thought everyone was depressed. <laughs> They're all looking down. And, <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm just curious, so is there, there seems to be an assumption here that voter turnout doesn't change if, if redistricting happens. And I'm wondering, is that, uh, is that true? Does it depend on party affiliation? Is there a delay between election cycles? There are a number of political science papers on that, but I, di I just did want to note that it's something that um, in, in our group that we think about and model. So you see these different turnout scenarios rather than one static turnout prediction. Um, in order to account for possible changes in turnout. So that's, that's to sort of sensitivity test the predictions against possible changes in turnout patterns. Does anyone else want to? Yeah, sure. So, um, right. so uh, when we apply uh, our method to analyze these districts, it's true, right? We're using some historical voting data to you know, predict how, uh, how favorable a district would be for uh, either party. But remember, so in our case, what we're trying to do is, is really determine whether you know, people got together with dark glasses in a smoke-filled room and tried to you know, do some evil deed of drawing a, a bad districting. And in that scenario, I mean, they, the, the idea is they did exactly that. They used some historical voting data to try to construct a districting which they predicted would be advantageous to them. And uh, we're trying to catch them in the act of that. So we're analyzing districts in a way which is analogous to, to in that sense, to what we're trying to measure. So like, on the good news, I mean, when you, there's a slide you show there's a good news, and then you say, like, those group listening to mathematician is good news, but I, I wonder, is that good news? <laughs> Nothing against mathematician, but Think about this way, they all buying and then do more research and sort of confirming, confirming the pattern and then means someone has a team of mathematician, data scientists and all that can start to manipulate and then the, as a consequence, large party continue to hold the control and the new voice never get heard because they, it's been, I mean, it, you crack the code, so whoever can use this code then, so I don't really find that's a good news. Okay, so the question I think broadly is about gameability, right? Is that, does that capture the spirit of the question? You're worried if these kinds of methods can be gamed by an adversary? Also, it's like, if, like, if you crack this and then like, people listen to that, so a climb up from more like a data science perspective, right? So you know, there's a pattern, so people can, okay, how to manipulate, like, to predict others' behavior, so the more, like, uh, resourceful people, they can start to predict, they have more resources, so the smaller voice, smaller I have a few reactions. I'm sure other people will too on gaming. You want to start? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I'll say, yeah. So there is like so far, uh, the lawsuits that have been successful in overturning districts have been overturning districts where somehow things are so extremely uh, it, it, They're all clear cases. In particular, right? You have these uh, these lawsuits, and and you have. You know, in principle, there are experts on both sides, but the experts for the defense in these cases are not actually bringing an analysis which even purports to show that the districts aren't gerrymandered. They're just trying, they're there to somehow cast general doubt and sort of raise uncertainty. Uh, so right now, I think in these cases, it's true. So uh, the only things that are being, the only districts that are being thrown out are, are these sort of overwhelming extreme gerrymanders. And I think there's a real question about, you know, once people start reacting to these methods and start drawing districtings which are sort of less egregious, but are just sort of, you know, kind of favorable to one side, I think it's much less clear that the legal system will feel comfortable addressing those. But I think, I mean, if I understand you, maybe part of your question is also about uh, sort of like the problems with there being too much reliance on expertise because then it's somehow exclusive. Is that part of your question? Um, right, and so, uh, 
So I would say an important answer to that is that, uh, so it's true, for example, that like in, in the stuff that I talked about, there, are, there is some you know, technical mathematics, although honestly it's not that deep, but there is some mathematics. Um, but these methods can only be used uh, effectively in uh, legal cases to the extent that people who are not mathematicians can understand them, right? So when you testify in these cases, uh, you, your success depends on you, know, you with your time on the stand being able to convince a judge with no formal mathematics training that they basically understand why what you're doing makes sense. And the fact that what we're doing is working right now in this setting is, is based on the fact that there, it is possible to understand it without having formal mathematical training. And I think if that wasn't the case, yeah, it, it would really be a problem. I think it's important that it's it, at least somehow the ideas of it are accessible without a lot of formal training. I, I have a couple other reactions to that. Um, so one is, um, who, who here saw, there was a piece in Slate, I think it was last week or a week and a half ago, which was like a closed door, like confab of gerrymanderers who um, were somehow recorded and slate printed the transcript of. Did you see this? Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, check it out. Okay. Um, sorry? Slate, actually, I promise. <laughs> um, and so, so I read this transcript eagerly. <laughs> and one of the things they said was, one, one of the, um, this happens to be Republican gerrymanderers, which you've been hearing a lot about today. There are all kinds of gerrymanderers out there. I probably don't have to remind you. But so in particular, this closed door Republican gerrymandering uh, event featured someone who was like, what about these mathematicians who are out there using computers to draw lots of maps? And the, and the, the other person was like, well, you know what? They are very smart. <laughs> and I was like, thanks. <laughs> That's right. um, but don't worry, because you can get those methods to say anything. And then they moved on to the next topic. And, and I, like you, probably had the reaction, really? Great, try it. <laughs> um, so I will say, in terms of openness and replicability, um, Wes and our group are the two <laughs> that have really released everything. We've released our data. We've released our code. Um, ours, uh, we have an open source uh, project called Jerry Chain for making these Markov chains that you can not only read, you can contribute to, and I encourage you to do that. Um, and I think that's an important part of the picture is this kind of openness. And we're using the peer review process, we're using the kind of open source culture um, as one of the ways to increase trust. Yeah, I'll say uh, just on the, uh, this topic of releasing, right, so when, in these cases, the defense has access to my code because I've released it publicly. And um, I mean, in this, in this most recent case, there was this, uh, uh, I mean, it's this very amusing thing where one of the other experts ran their own analysis using my code and then didn't show it in their report because I guess they didn't like the answer, but you could find, there's this exchange of data in these cases where you provide like backup data that f for your, what your experts did. And in the backup data they provided, we could find the histograms that their expert generated using our method. And so then we could reproduce them and show the court, look, even the defense's own expert ran a Markov chain analysis and found the same thing that we did, which is that the enacted map is some crazy outlier. So, uh, right, so in that sense, they, they couldn't take our method and get it to give a different answer. They, they reached the same conclusion. And just like one more sentence, and you guys please jump in anytime. One more sentence on that. Um, in terms of gameability, which I think is a really important question and which I do think about and worry about because if our code is out there, you know, uh, Maptitude, which is uh, commercial software for making redistricting plans, they just sent out an email this week that says, our new software release will make optimal automatic plans for you. And I was like, hmm, really interesting. Um, so yeah, when the software is out there, anyone can use it and they can use it for however they want to use it. Um, but I think the good news is the sort of way that I think about gaming is that as long as you're not using one of these metrics that has a big interpretive gap to the thing that you're measuring, if you're actually using vote shares or seed outcomes, um, then the, the gaming shows in the outcome. Right, so it's, uh, that gives me increased confidence that even though, yes, absolutely, these methods can be used to make extreme maps, they can also be used to notice that. I saw a okay. lot of hands, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, okay, uh, it's not up to me, yeah. <laughs> um, so the first speaker, Wes, talked about districting under constraints of similar uh, ethnic or cultural uh, background, and um, so I was wondering, is it possible to appease all these constraints and still maintain fairness? 
And also, when you run your MCMC, uh, the, the question has two parts. The second part is, when you run your MCMC, you can condition on certain constraints, and therefore that p-value or marginal probability will change. And uh, related to this gameability, the, 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 the bad guys could condition on certain things so that the p-value is not significant. Or, yeah. So I was wondering about that. Are you asking me a question? You have a, the first question is for you, maybe, and the next one for me. Yeah, can you, can you, can you, yeah. I guess that the title of your was. So like, the, the answer is sometimes it's not possible to satisfy everything. Um, and uh, sometimes it is. Like uh, a lot of times a randomly drawn map satisfies everything that people want. Um, but uh, there exist instances where uh, that's not possible. So, and your second question can be answered by Wes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. So, um, right. So the question was about right. So I, I said you can implement this list of constraints when you do this analysis, and uh, right. So it seems like in principle, then your outcome, whether you decide this gerrymander, could have depended on your constraints, right? If, if I understand you right. Um, right, and so for example, if you take this uh, most recent case in North Carolina, there's some, some list of constraints which the legislature said they used, right? And so the idea is we implement these constraints that they said they used. But it's true that there's still some flexibility. So for example, um, the districts are supposed to be compact, and it's not specified exactly what that means, and there are different ways of trying to measure that. So in these analyses, uh, what I do is I conduct the analysis with a lot of different choices of this compactness measure and show that it's insensitive to that. Um, so I show that you get essentially the same answer regardless of which you use. In the case of, uh, right, so, uh, I, right, in this case, it, it was an astonishing level of insensitivity. So let's say that I, I changed uh, from using a compactness measure based on this isoparametric inequality to one based on uh, measuring the uh, total perimeter of the districts, for example. Not only did I find that, like, the, you know, the, that the outlier status was roughly the same, like both, both around 10 to the minus 9, what I found in this case is that it was exactly the same. Right, so like if you ran, if you used the same random number generator, so you were you were using the same uh, random seed and everything, it would be exact. It would be exactly the same breaking point at which things would get fairer forever. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's so sense. Like the, these maps were so carefully optimized that it takes so few changes before you get to the space where all of them are fair. That all the constraints that you're imposing are almost irrelevant because. It just takes two or three changes on the whole map before you start noticing something different. Um, and so that won't always be the case. So there will be cases where it, it's, it, it takes you know, hundreds or thousands or, or however many changes before you, you find things are fair. And then there will be subtle differences depending on the compactness criterion. And our approach is just to, to try a lot of things and show the results of a lot of things. And to point out that the defense could have tried some other things too with my code. If they, really, if they really had some other definition of compactness that they, that they thought was the reason for the map's properties, they could have demonstrated that in the chain. Great set of talks. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between the math and the outcomes. So imagine that we used a demographic uh, characteristic other than geography. And um, so now, you know, districts are, you know, what, everybody who went to the same school or everybody who speaks Portuguese or, you know, pick your favorite demographic. Um, what would happen, what, what, would, what would remain invariant and what would need to be changed in terms of the way you all approach the problem? One thing to say about that is that sometimes people ask me, what if districts were not geographical but instead randomly assigned. So here we are in Massachusetts, we have nine districts. What if a random number generator gave you a district assignment one through nine? Well, that would be pretty bad, right? right. <laughs> the central limit theorem tells you that would be pretty bad because even if your state were 5149, every district would be 5149 and you'd get a perfect sweep. You'd turn slight advantage into a perfect sweep. But that's not what you were suggesting. You were just asking, what are some alternatives to the ge geography? So uh, to that, you know, one, all, I would, all I have to say to that is that one of the traditional districting criteria, and one that I predict is going to really blow up in attention and usability in the next cycle or two, is the preservation of communities of interest. 
So part of the logic of districts from the founding of the country um, is about territorial community and about the idea that um, due to either self-sorting or sorting by the state, um, often you'll have people with common interests who tend to live close together and that a geographical district can better capture those common interests and magnify that voice in government. So I, yes, absolutely. You know, this is a, a panel of mathematicians who are thinking about both the beautiful abstraction and the real world problem. But you'll notice if you go around and talk to sort of a random sample of mathematicians, they'll say, the way we vote is stupid. We should blow it up and do it some other way. Um, and, and you know, yes, there are lots of other ways to do voting, and some of them do have some traction. Um, but um, trying, to under, trying to understand um, and serve the, the kind of ideal purpose of districts is part of what I think is interesting about, um, about redistricting. And, and so the preservation of communities of interest is high on that list. Anyone else have a comment for that? Is that okay? Yep. Uh, I'd just uh, like to connect uh, this afternoon's conversation back uh, to the morning a little bit. And one of the things that there was some unease or worry about in the morning was the idea of uh, being confronted with uncertainty uh, in, in data. And along those lines, I found Wes's presentation to be very reassuring in the sense of the court's being receptive to quantitative information and p-values and you know quantitatively measuring how certain are we that this is a, um, a gerrymandered district. And so I would be interested to hear kind of the panel's reflections. I mean, of course, there is the big and probably still mostly unanswered question of what's the interaction between differential privacy and uh, redistricting. But um, maybe just reflecting on that question of incorporating uncertainty into how we use census data. Okay, I'd be happy to start. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I, I think a lot about um, census data. I think a lot about differential privacy, as many people here know. Um, and, um, and its impact on redistricting. So I was happy to hear that raised um, this morning. Um, so one reaction, if you think back to the morning and we heard about this index of dissimilarity as a measure of segregation, and one uh, and a theme was that th we might see jumps in this index of dissimilarity. And there was some discussion of whether that index was a good one in the first place, if it could be really unstable when a single person was moved, right? And then part of the answer was, but it's been used and it will continue to be used, so we have to think about it, which of course is correct and part of the story. Um, but hopefully that whole discussion made you wonder whether, as you brought up, Salil, in your comments later, whether it was worth moving away from that to other measures of whether that helped us understand that it was worth moving away from dissimilarity. Okay, so now let's go back to redistricting, where one of the habits of redistrictors for the last several cycles has been to redistrict using itty bitty teeny tiny units, the smallest ones the census will provide, census blocks. Okay, and what's the reason to use block-based redistricting, to use these tiny particles to make your plan instead of using bigger units like um, precincts, which is where the election data are reported, administrative units. Um, what's the reason to do that? Um, the claim has been it's to get perfect population balance. Right, and so out of, um, out of the 50 states, um, out of the maybe 43 or so that have multiple congressional districts, um, 41 of them, or maybe 40 of them, balanced to within one person, one person or so, um, census population, um, according to census blocks, by using census blocks. And so partly my reaction to some of the uncertainty introduced by differential privacy is, um, uh, an unintended happy side effect is that it stands a good chance of breaking this bad habit of, the, of treating the census data like absolute gospel and using it to excuse other bad practices in redistricting. If you look at some of the most ugly and contorted districts that exist in the country, you'll actually find the legislators who 
were in charge of the process of drawing them, on record saying, that crazy praying mantis in Maryland? We didn't mean for it to look that way. We just had to balance population to one person. On the list of things that mathematicians say are stupid, taking the district populations down to one person deviation based on this data being a perfect model of today's population when you draw, I mean, this is high on the list. Yeah, High, high on the yeah. list, I think we can all agree. Um, uh, we're out of time, um, but I, I did want to at least, because it's so important and no one has said very much about this yet, Cynthia um, addressed it a little bit in her comments earlier, but the Voting Rights Act has been the biggest, best, and most powerful tool to handle gerrymandering abuses that, that we've had for the last 50 years, um, because there hasn't been and continues not to be um, a federal rule against partisan gerrymandering, right? Um, and to enforce the Voting Rights Act, there are preconditions called jingles factors. I'm not gonna go into any technical detail, but just to say there's a checklist of conditions that you have to meet. And one of the worries about differential privacy that has sometimes been articulated is it's gonna make it harder to meet those conditions. So, so Cynthia sort of mentioned this. Um, and that's one of the things that, that our group is looking at is the likelihood that um, the different amounts of noise that are introduced into um, census data by DP are anywhere close to shaking up um, actual VRA cases. Uh, and if you wanna hear more about that since we're out of time, um, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. It's something we're working on actively. Okay, so um, let's uh, thank the panelists for a terrific <laughs> session. And, and thanks so much to Shelley and the organizers for a great conference and a great journal. <laughs>